I've always been fascinated by why governments pursue sometimes extreme social policy that suddenly becomes normal. And I think I figured out why. It's because we don't have good leaders. Here in Canada, there are some jurisdictions that are considering if a child is transitioning and wants to use a preferred pronoun different than what they use at home, that schools will respect that and not tell the parent. Now, I'm not a parent, but I consider that policy quite extreme. But more than that, I don't know if there's any research out there that shows that this is actually beneficial to the child at all. And that to me is the crux of the issue. And so we don't have leaders who've studied the impacts of social policy on the individual from a psychological perspective, um, uh, a health and wellness perspective, but instead there's this push for these extreme policies by leaders who are not equipped to handle those questions, if that makes sense. So when we think about this, and I'm gonna set the stage because this is how government functions, right? So we elect a leader and that person and their party sets the tone. They set the objectives and the tone of the different policies that they're going to pursue. So in this case, say their policy is yes, we, we respect the child's rights to do that. So suddenly the policy across all schools in a given jurisdiction must enforce that. And in addition, governments can send out communications to schools to put up on their walls. Maybe they even provide funding to schools for extra guidance counselors specifically for children who are transitioning. Or maybe they provide more funding for um, education to children about gender fluidity and sexual orientation that's very different than male and female. These are all possibilities that could happen. Now, what does this mean for the child? Well, the child may actually be having other mental health and physical health and wellness episodes in their lives that don't get that amount of attention or funding from a government. So if they're in the public school, there's more um, advertisements and awareness about transitioning, sexual orientation, gender identity, and there may even be specific guidance counselors to help a child through the transition process. Now, this isn't to say there are no children who are not transgender. Of course there are. There are, I mean, that's just the reality. But the amount of transgender children out there, I don't think anyone really knows. Okay, so the government sets the tone, they provide funding, there's these guidance counselors out there, there's more exposure to gender fluidity and sexual orientation for the child. And as well, the child now knows that if they do transition, the school is this quote unquote safe space to do so. Now, again, that's just a small policy that governments can do right now based on a leader who has no idea the impact that policy has on the child. And because that leader has maybe special interest groups and community-based organizations saying that this is necessary, the government says, okay, we're, we're supporting children who are transitioning at the earliest age possible by providing safe spaces for them to do so, starting with the schools. Now, that's just the schools. And we have community-based organizations who see what the government's doing, and instead of doing the hard work and the research to say, mm, I don't know if this is a good or bad policy, what do community-based organizations who are strapped for cash who get most of their funding from governments do. They start building a narrative around the government's priorities, right? So if the government's priorities are to, you know, create the safe space for young people at school to transition, LGBTQ plus groups may very well start highlighting stories of people who experienced trauma 
and hate at a very young age for transitioning and may even speak well to the idea of a safe space in schools. Now, I'm not dis dis dismissing these people's experiences, but in this example, we can see how both governments and community-based organizations are doing the same thing. They are not trying to get to whether or not this policy is actually beneficial for the child. That's left for researchers in research-based institutions, which by the way, many are also funded by governments. So there's this trifecta that's happening here. We have a government policy that's being set forth to schools. We have community-based organizations reinforcing that government policy. And we may very well have researchers in research institutions funded in part, if not in whole by government, all singing from the same songbook. So it takes social scientists and others a deeper, it requires them to take a deeper dive to say, I don't know if this policy works. Let me do some deep research about the impacts this is having on a child. That takes a lot of work. And that lens is harder and harder to, to be provided to government when it's new territory and nobody really knows what's happening here. So that's why I say we're not electing good leaders because leaders are politically driven. They have a term of two to four years in some cases. Um, they have special interest groups that are feeding them information and maybe they already think that this is a good idea so they just pursue it without doing the deep research. It actually would be better if leaders would come out and say, I don't know this to be true, but I do know that there are transgender children. There are children who are transgender and there may very well be merit in creating some type of um, um, account, account um, what's that? Not accountability. Uh, uh, I didn't want to say safe, but like uh, some type of space that allows that child to explore their gender identity and sexual orientation and may even include counseling to help that child navigate difficult conversations with their parents, etc. I'm sure some of these already exist, but that's a much more nuanced approach to setting policy instead of saying, this is what we consider a safe space to be. If you want to change your gender and sexual orientation, that's fine. We won't tell your parents. Right? Because the idea is there's fear that your parents are going to enact some form of physical, sexual, sorry, physical or emotional violence towards you. And we're going to protect you from that. Again, there's no research that I know of that shows when a child is transitioning, there are increased levels of extreme physical and emotional and mental violence in the home. Right? Now, I'm not saying that doesn't exist. Certainly it does. But there's also data we have to rely on if we're going to make large scale policy. And our leaders are not good to unravel that and say, oh, I don't know, like this is, we're kind of playing with the next generation here and we don't fully understand the psychological impacts. That's one. You know, I think the other thing is uh, Chris Cuomo, of all people, had recently said this on the Patrick Bet David podcast with Candace Owens that I think there's like an approval rating of 14% for the average congressperson in the United States, and yet they're reelected 94% of the time, some wild stat like that. And so I think most every person can see through a lot of our politicians, which is too bad because there are some good politicians too. Um, but they also get reelected. And I think the reason why is because we are so checked out as a population from our politicians. So that's interesting. 14% on average approval rating, 94% reelected, reelected. So part, part of not electing good leaders is not just that they're not good leaders. It's also partly on us. We're not electing good leaders. Um, and the last thing I want to say is something Thomas Sowell brought up in an a, a interview he did last year, Thomas Sowell said, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something like, we're not looking at the research that's been done decades and decades ago. 
that are still relevant today when it comes to social policy. Um, and that's the frustrating part, I think, for, for researchers, for social scientists, et cetera, who've studied these topics in and out, and still they're bubbling up and we get these kind of catchphrases when it comes to big social policy, right? So the dumbing down of our social policy is a result of not electing good leaders, partly them, but also partly us for electing them, um, not doing a deep dive, which includes looking at the research from multiple lenses um, and coming to a conclusion, um, and also being very aware that once government sets an agenda, community organizations, research institutions, everyone kind of supports the government because they need to get funding in some way. So that's my synopsis on the world's issues. Uh, we need to elect better leaders. But I think it also means that we as a population have to do a better job of calling our leaders out when we know that they're pursuing policy that doesn't fully make sense. So hats off to all the people who are kind of questioning the government on the school policies here in Canada. Um, we need to do more of that. And it's not an adversarial relationship, I think. It's more of a pause. Let's really think about the impacts this policy will have on children. And instead of making the policy, maybe we test out some elements and do some pilots, um, but we don't you know, make this like this, the, the policy for all schools to adopt. What do you think? Do you think that assessment is true? Uh, let me know in the comment section below and hopefully we can elect better leaders in the coming years ahead.